European Union Withdrawal Bill Committee. Now, order. Order. European Union Withdrawal Bill. We begin with uh, new clause three, with which it will be convenient to consider the new clauses and amendments as set out in the selection paper. Yvette Cooper. Many people who argued that what they were doing in the referendum was arguing to bring parliamentary sovereignty back, to bring sovereignty back here, from having shared sovereignty with the EU. I don't we're actually arguing that instead sovereignty should be handed over in a concentrated way to a small group of ministers instead. Powers in this bill are subject to affirmative resolution and those that are not are now going to be subject to a sifting committee. We are recovering from a situation where as members of the European Union we had handed over all these decisions lock, stock and barrel to the European Union. So this is a massive improvement and to address this attempt to reverse Brexit up as, a, up as an argument, up as an argument in favour of parliamentary sovereignty is nothing but cant. Oh my, what Stalinism is this, that somehow any attempt to disagree with the way in which this bill is drawn up is somehow a betrayal of Brexit. What rubbish! Yeah. How, how insecure are members who are objecting to any changes in this bill if they cannot see that it is Parliament's job? And it is a job that they argued for when they stood up and tried to defend parliamentary sovereignty. They argued for Parliament to take some responsibility and to do its job by scrutinising legislation, by proposing amendments to legislation. That is all we are doing now. We are putting forward an amendment to the way in which the Brexit process should take That's place right. to the way in which the withdrawal process should take place. The power that the executive will have in making regulations under this clause will be subject to Parliament because secondary legislation comes to Parliament. Yeah. This is of an order of magnitude different from regulations made by the European Union, which can be made by qualified majority vote against the will of the British Government and automatically British law. Yeah. So this is in fact restoring parliamentary oversight to the making of laws. The actual reasons that have been given for rejecting the proposals are all administrative convenience. They're obscure drafting amendments. I congratulate the parliamentary draftsman on producing such extraordinary, sort of uh, amazing, minutiae arguments to supporting the amazing aspirations of civil servants who see a mountain of work before them and hope that most of it can proceed with the minimum of political scrutiny. <laughs> Um, I thank my right honourable and learned friend for giving way, and I certainly respect his consistency on this issue. He is on public record as having once said that he looks forward to the day when Westminster Parliament will be nothing more than a council chamber of the European Parliament. This whole debate is about whether honourable and right honourable members are content that Parliament be a spectator, a passive observer into one of the most important decisions that has faced our country in generations. Parliament must have a grip on the process, and I so therefore move our amendments and new clauses. The purpose of the amendment, the nature of it, is entirely lost in a confrontation in which it is suggested that the underlying purpose is the sabotage of the will of the people, Absolutely. which it most manifestly is not. Yeah. The agreement that was reached last week, which we welcome, is the easy bit. It's the easy bit of this negotiation. The really difficult bit is phase. about right. to begin. Those who have thought in this process that leaving the European Union was about keeping all the things that they like and getting rid of all of the things that they don't like are now in for a rude awakening. Yep. Not least because the clock would be running down. Of course I will get away. Well. He's now getting to the nub of the issue. Because if a meaningful vote in his definition is that Parliament should have the ability to say to the government, we don't like the deal you've got, we're not accepting no deal, go back to the EU and negotiate another deal. What chance yeah. does he really think that those who don't want us to leave in the first place are ever going to offer a deal which can be bought by this House? You either, you either exit 
without a deal, or you exit with a deal. If the deal is rejected, but the government is told that it cannot leave without a deal, then it cannot leave. There are no other logical possibilities. There seems to be an inordinate racket behind me being made by one of my colleagues. I'm very grateful to the honourable gentleman. Does he not concede that there was a, a, a meaningful vote uh, on the 23rd of June 2016 when people voted to leave the European Union? The problem with my right honourable and learned friend's amendment is that it could be and no doubt is designed to be used to try to overturn and frustrate that meaningful vote. And can I assure him, can I assure him, it's a shame, well, my, my right honourable friend and learned friend laughs, it's a shame he hasn't got the courage of his convictions to admit that that's what his game is. But the point is, if, if people in this House use that amendment for those purposes, the backlash from the British public will be like none seen before, and he should beware of that consequence. We are trying to negotiate a good deal, but that takes two to tango, and yet what this amendment does is leave open the door for the other side to actually try and not negotiate a good deal, yeah. knowing that they could drag out the negotiations and therefore um, prevent, at least until this Parliament was to accept the deal, um, us leaving the EU. The incentive is to make sure that the deal is as bad as possible, so we are left in that limbo position where we can't leave and yet we can't move on. It would be really rather foolish for this part, this House and the Government to premise all their plans on the basis that that request will be acceded to, because it requires unanimity. And I don't know that I've heard a single European diplomat or public statement from the European Union that suggested for a moment that they would countenance extending the deadline. And of course, why would they? Because of course the deadline written into Article 50 is to their advantage. Those of us who opposed the government when it was very pro-European should not criticise members like my right honourable friend and learned friend, the member for Beaconsfield, or as Disraeli pronounced it, Beaconsfield, uh, when they decide that they should take the reverse position from the one we took in, in previous years. As far as I'm concerned, I'm prepared to stay up all night long passing legislation to get us out of the European Union as soon as possible. And for that reason, I urge the government to withdraw Clause 9, and I have to say I cannot support it at stand pass. David. I applaud honourable members opposite who are standing by their principles and remembering the importance of coming back to this debate in this House. Either ditch Clause 9, agree to new Clause 3 or agree to Amendment 7. I will withdraw my new Clause 3 in favour of Amendment 7 in order to support the honourable yeah. member. is correct. The eyes to the right, 309. The nose to the left, 305. <laughs> Order! I'm sure you want to hear the result to make sure it is correct. <laughs> the eyes to the right, 309. The nose to the left, 305. The eyes have it, the eyes have it. Unlock! Uh, Mr Hoyle, uh, what a privilege it is uh, to have the opportunity to speak on such a uh, momentous evening when Parliament has had the guts and the foresight to stand up to the executive and to take back control, yeah. give some hope back to those who thought all hope uh, was lost, and to see all parties 
members from all parties coming together, working together in the national interest. But before I give away to the Honourable Gentleman, I'd like to move New Cause 20. That stands in my name and those of my Honourable Friends. But I give away, of course. It, I have to say, it is wonderful to see so many former ministers on my side of the House discover their love of parliamentary sovereignty when they are no longer on the ministerial merry-go-round. I have far greater respect in this place for those parliamentarians who have never held ministerial office and actually do respect this place, even when things are not going their way. I beg leave to report that the committee has made progress and ask leave to sit again. Committee to sit again what day? Tomorrow. Tomorrow.